Woods Runner, Chapter 15. They were still several days away from the city of New York. An almost constant stream of refugees came at them. Some had obviously been soldiers or fighting men of one kind or another. There were many with wounds wrapped in crudge, crude bandages. Abner stopped the wagon and furnished, furnished bandages for those who didn't have them. He also had a supply of laudanum, a painkiller that was half opium and half alcohol. And he gave some of the more gravely wounded a small bottle. Take it sparingly, he said in a deep voice. Best at night before sleeping. To everyone he said, stay off the roads, redcoats are about. Cart after wagon after cart passed them being pulled by mules or oxen. A goodly number of people were soldiers, but the vast majority were civilians, often whole families. Where do you suppose they're all going, Samuel thought, of the devastation on the trail to his rear? It certainly didn't seem like a safe place. Hessians, soldiers, savages, down to Philadelphia? Abner nodded. At times, travelers were so thick, Abner had trouble moving the wagon through. Are they running from the Redcoats? This from Annie, who teared up when she saw a little girl trudging along and holding a doll by one arm. That and more, Abner said. Not just the soldiers. Like I said, some of them aren't that bad. I mean, a while ago, we were all loyal Englishmen. It's more what red coats signify. The English crown has become a way of life these people no longer want. Part is they're scared. Don't know what will happen. But along with that, these people are sick of being told what to do by a crazy king who lives 3,000 miles away and doesn't care about them one way or the other. What do you mean crazy, Samuel asked. King George, Abner said. They say he's titched, crazy as a bag of hazelnuts. They've got people to catch him when he runs wild, put his clothes on when he tears them off, watch him when he sleeps so he doesn't kill himself. He's no man to run a kingdom. Did he start the war? It seemed like a logical question. The war was so crazy. Maybe a crazy man started it. Probably not. It began on this side of the ocean in Boston, not over there. People were sick of being treated like livestock. The dogs had been going ahead now and then to greet some people, their tails wagging, holding back with others. But now they dropped well back and Abner stopped the wagon. British coming. If he hadn't seen the dogs, he wouldn't have known anyway. All the men who looked like Patriot soldiers evaporated off the trail into the brush. The soldiers came marching in a file, not Hessians, but regular British soldiers. They must have been two or 300 of them, as near as Samuel could estimate, marching in loose route steps, followed by supply wagons. They did nothing threatening. They didn't stop at all, except to work around wagons that couldn't get out of the way soon enough. Abner watched them go by in silence, nodding at some of them, and when they were gone, he started up the mules. It was late in the day, and he said, why don't we stop for a good meal tonight? They had been eating corn and venison, which was about gone. Samuel had been thinking he should take his rifle and head into the woods for another deer tomorrow. What do you mean? I mean, I have somebody cook us a meal. Say the people in that farm over there. And he pointed to a farm set well back off the road with neat white fences and white painted house. Right there. Samuel and Annie said nothing. The house reminded Samuel of Annie's home before the Hessians, and he wondered if she felt the same. As they had gotten closer to the city, there had been more and more cleared farms. Some were nice, even beautiful. Some had been attacked and burned probably by the Hessians, but many had not. It made no sense, nor did it follow any logic like so much of what had happened. Abner pulled the wagon into the long drive and then the yard. There was a wooden watering trough by a hand pump and mules went to, to it and started drinking. Abner and Samuel climbed down from the wagon. Let them drink, Abner said. 
Mules won't blow themselves by over drinking the way horses do. There was a barn painted red as Caleb's had been. Samuel sneaked a look at Annie, but she seemed to take it in stride. A man came from the barn who was tall, thin, and had a tired felt hat, which he pushed to the back of his head. He started to say something, but before he could get anything out, Abner held up his hand. Name's Abner McDougal. Honored to do the house and we come in peace. I have a fine surface sharpening stone wheel and I repair and sharpen all tools in the house and barn. All work for one good meal for me and my barons. Well, also buy and sell rags. Have some nice linen rags if the lady of the house needs some soft garment material. He spoke fast, never letting the man get a word in. If you don't need anything, we've got, we'll just thank you for your water, for the mules and be on our way. The man removed his hat and rubbed his head. Well, I've got some sickle bars that could use a honing and Speck Martha has some knives that need touching up. No sooner said than done. Sam, why don't you get the sharpening wheel down and we'll get to edging things up. Samuel, who had never been called Sam in his life, went to the back of the wagon and peered into the mess. He hadn't really looked at it before, but now as he pulled some things aside, he found a sharpening wheel, a wood frame, and a treadle, and a small tin cup of drip water on the stone. When he pulled it out of the way, he found a wire-covered crate pushed under some things. It had some kind of birds in it, and on closer examination, he saw they were pigeons, live pigeons. How strange. He hadn't even known they were there. Why were they hidden? He took the wheel down and put it in the trough and filled the tin cup and hung it by the wire over the wheel so the water would drip from a small hole in the can onto the stone. He made sure the treadle worked and the wheel spun. The man came from the barn with three hand sickles that had long curved blades used for harvesting wheat and other grains. Abner took one, stood by the wheel, and gestured to Samuel to start pumping with his legs to get the stone spinning. Abner held the first blade against the stone as it turned, making a scraping hissing sound. The steel edge ground down the razor sharpness. Samuel was amazed at how easily the stone spun. It shouldn't take too long. How peaceful it all seemed. He kept pumping until the sickle was done. Then another, and Samuel switched pumping legs. Legs a little tired, and another. He switched legs again. Legs a little more tired. Then three axes, two picks, a tomahawk, and a set of rail splitting wedges, six of them, four slaughtering, and sticking knives and four butcher knives that Martha, a short thin woman who was all smiles brought from the house. Then an ice chisel, two serrated hay knives, two planking adds, one shingle fro, and at last an old cavalry saber that the farmer named Micah used for chopping corn. Samuel staggered over to the trough to wash. Abner put his whole head under water and then shook like a dog. He pulled his hair back and combed his beard down and Samuel saw Micah smile at him. He saw something else there. A look of what? Recognition? As if they already knew each other. The meal was good, very good, though not up to what they had eaten at Caleb's. Venison stew piled with new potatoes, fresh bread, and new butter. Apple pie made with maple sugar and fresh buttermilk cool from the spring house on the side of the barn in quantities to fill even Samuel. He was shy about asking for seconds, but Martha kept piling it on and he ate it gratefully. Sit down meals were always rare in his life, even before the war. He winced at the thought before the war. There didn't seem, there didn't seem to be such a thing anymore. What with his living in the woods on the hunt most of the time, but being a guest was almost unheard of, and he wasn't sure how to act. He needn't have worried. As with Caleb and Ma, Micah and Martha made eating enjoyable, not something to fret over. When they were done with seconds and thirds on the pie, even Annie ate like a wolf. 
They went out to sit on the porch while Micah and Abder lit up clay pipes with coals from the fireplace. Food gets better every time I stop here, Abner said, ending the mystery. I didn't think it was possible. She can cook, Micah nodded, smiling. In fact, there ain't much she can't do. Annie and Samuel sat at the edge of the porch. The dogs were in the dirt in front of them. Annie was about to doze off, but Samuel wanted to listen, so he sat drawing pictures in the dirt with a stick. The dogs watching with a kind of casual interest as the stick moved around. Know anything about what's happened in New York? Abner asked. How it went? Micah shook his head. Not much. The English took it and a bunch of prisoners. They moved in. The English took over houses for their own. They ain't making a lot of friends. Of course, that doesn't seem to bother them much. Not making friends. The way they brought those damn Hessians into it. Hiring mad dogs. The passes I brought you working out? So far, I'm more worried about scavengers hitting us. The wild ones would kill you for a turnip. But we're still here, ain't we? Good, I've got some more bird, birds to leave you. You still have that hutch in the back of the barn? Yes, same as before. Send one if anything big comes along. I'll send one this evening. We saw a large detachment. We saw a large detachment heading up the road today. Maybe 200. They ought to know about it back in Philadelphia. If the Hawks don't get them. I don't know how any of them get past the Hawks. Well, there's always that, always some risk, but it's better than nothing. The pigeons are for carrying messages, Samuel thought. He glanced at Abner out of the corner of his eye there was so much more to him than he thought at first. The men sat smoking in silence for a moment. Then Abner said, you said they took some prisoners. Sam's parents weren't military, but they took them prisoners anyway. They're doing that? Oh, they're doing that, Ab Micah nodded. No sense to it. Just see a man working in the field and take him prisoner, stupid like they think the crops are gonna plant themselves. You know where they're keeping the prisoners? Not certain. There are warehouses and an old sugar mill. You remember that three-story thing they built to mill sugar? Abner nodded. Along the waterfront? Yes, I think they might use that along with the warehouse. There are thousands of prisoners. I don't know how they'll feed them. Plus, I suppose plenty of them were wounded. Can't be good for them. Well, Abner said, knocking his pipe out of the side of it, out on the side of the porch. This Samuel saw mad the dogs, made the dogs stand up and get ready. He was amazed by them. They saw everything. Well, we'll see what we can see, Abner said. It was starting to get dark. You mind if we sleep here tonight? We'll be out, out of here early. Why would I mind? There's new hay in the loft. Make a good bed, as long as you don't smoke. And with the mules unharnessed, fed hay, and put out in a pen for the night, Abner took time to put two pigeons in the hutch in the back of the barn. He wrote something on a tiny piece of thin paper, tied it to a third pigeon's leg, and let it go. Let him go. He and Samuel and Annie watched the bird fly away to the south. He'll roost somewhere Tonight, if he doesn't get there before dark, it's probably only 40 miles in a straight flight, an hour the way they move. So he should make it. Imagine moving through the air at 40 miles an hour. Just imagine. Later, lying in the new hay with the clover smell thick around him, Samuel could hear Annie breathing regularly in sleep. He teetered on the edge of it, but before it, it came, he said to Abner, who was lying just above him on the stacked hay bales, you and Micah aren't what you seem to be, are you? We are, Abner chuckled, exactly what we seem to be, and maybe just a little bit more. All right, communication, civilian intelligence, individuals 
and civilian spy networks carried out the most vital American intelligence op operations of the Revolutionary War. Men and women whose daily lives and work brought them into proximity with British military, such as farmers and merchants, fed important information to the American authorities throughout the war. Some patriots even posed as loyalists to infiltrate pro-British groups, collecting detailed facts about British military operations and defenses, supply lines, and battle plans. All right, that's chapter 15.